So for people who say, okay, so you want me to be in nutritional ketosis, which means I'm going to eat more fat than I'm used to eating because I usually, you know, live on carbohydrates. So am I going to be trading cancer? Maybe, maybe I'll kill the cancer cells, but do I then get heart disease and have a heart attack or have blocked arteries? No, I we, right. we, you can actually get super healthy. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching our videos. If you'd like to support us some more, you can explore our homemade natural skincare products at purelytallow.com. Thank you so much for supporting my small business. Hey everybody, welcome to the Carnivore Revolution. I'm Serena, and my guest today is Dr. Seafried. Dr. Seafried is a cancer specialist, a cancer scientist, and I'm really glad to have you here today, Dr. Seafried. Thank you so much for taking the time. No, oh, thank you, uh, Serena. It's nice to be here. And I think this is a really important conversation because I would say that every person who is listening to this or watching this has been touched by cancer with more than 1,700 people dying every day of cancer. Everybody has been touched by that. And so I think it's a really important conversation to have. Yes, I agree. So tell us first how this happened, how you became uh, interested in studying and helping people fight cancer. Well, as I said in, in some of these shows before, I mean, it wasn't our intention at the beginning to um, to get into this um space, I guess you can call it. But the research took us here. And um, we have been researching the metabolism of cancer now for quite quite some time. I wrote a I wrote a book on this, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease on the Origin, Management, and Prevention of Cancer, based on the research that we had done here at Boston College and decades of research in the field of epilepsy and ketogenic diets and things like this. So it became just a, a, a crossover of fields before we realized that um, Otto Warburg had defined the nature of cancer back almost 100 years ago. In fact, it was 100 years ago. And his... Um, descriptions of the ab abnormal metabolism uh, in cancer is what we have, have also uh, seen in no uncertain terms. I mean, there are some things that we're clearing up about what Warburg had found and modernizing a lot of what he, he originally did. But the bottom line is that we can't find any cancer cells that can grow uh, without um, fermentation energy, which is driven by the sugar glucose and the amino acid glutamine, meaning that uh, most cancers have a common problem. They, they need a fermentation energy that's energy without oxygen. And that clearly tells us the, the path for the best management and also prevention of cancer. So once you know that, then the, the path forward becomes very clear on how to do this. The problem is, of course, you have um, an industry, both uh, academic pharmaceutical industries that are still locked onto the fact they think that cancer is a genetic disease, which it's not. And then you have all of the so-called treatments um, and procedures that are all linked into that view. So, and it's very hard to change in a, um, a dogmatic ideology an indoctrination, so to speak, of both of both industry and academics to to change the path. But eventually, it will move into the right direction. It just it just takes time. So, what does it mean that cancer is a is a metabolic disease? What does that mean? It means that they it's how they get and everything comes back to energy. Um, without energy, nothing can grow. Um, so, how how does the cancer cell uh, get energy? So, what it, it's then it comes back to metabolism. Uh, how you, how you generate energy from nutrients. So we eat food, we breathe oxygen. All right. So otherwise we'd be dead. So how, we get energy from oxidative phosphorylation. That's why we breathe air and we breathe oxygen in the air, and that allows us to uh, um, capture the energy and the and the carbon hydrogen bonds of the foods that we eat. Those carbon hydrogen bonds originally produced from the energy of the sun. So we we have a a, a a method within our cells that breaks carbon hydrogen bonds uh, using oxygen uh, to facilitate this process. Uh, cancer cells don't do that. They they can live without oxygen. So how do they live without oxygen? And the answer is they use an ancient pathways of fermentation, which are the pathways that uh, were used by all living things on the planet before oxygen came into the atmosphere 2.5 billion years ago. So the cancer cells are simply falling back on these ancient pathways 
uh, and they don't need oxygen. And that's one of the great differences between normal cells and cancer cells. The normal cells need oxygen to, to live uh, and survive, where cancer cells use an ancient pathway of fermentation. So people say, well, then what's the energy for fermentation? And we have interrogated these tumor cells up and down, and they can't live without the sugar glucose or the amino acid glutamine. So that tells us if we take away glucose and glutamine, they become vulnerable to death and they can't transition to fatty acids or ketone bodies because that requires oxygen and they don't use oxygen. So it becomes now a straightforward way to kill and manage, kill the tumor cells without harming the body. And that's the, the strategy that will work and will eventually become the standard of care. It's just that we're locked into a big standard procedure that makes it hard to move that. So some people believe that there is some sort of big conspiracy theory um, that they want to keep us sick, whoever they are. Um, I find that hard to believe. But if these things are true, if we can kill cancer cells by starving them of glucose and glutamine, then why isn't this common knowledge? And why aren't we treating it like that here? Well, it's because of the ideological dogma. Um, why do you think a devout Christian could not accept Islam as the true religion? or vice versa. That's called dogma. That's It's an effect on the brain, okay? Um, it took many hundreds of years for the Catholic Church to realize that the uh, Earth was not the center of the solar system. They claimed, it, uh, they, they claimed it was the Earth. They didn't recognize that it was the sun. And if you cha challenge the dogma and the authority of power, uh, you would be burned at the stake like they did to Giordano Bruno. OK, mm -hmm. that's because the dogma said the Earth was the center of the solar system. And if you challenged it like uh, like Galileo, you were house arrested. And if you challenged it like Bruno, you were burned at the stake. Eventually, it was realized that, no, the sun is, in fact, the center of the solar system. And people, the uh, 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 advancement of knowledge happened that way. So so we, right now we're locked into the, the ideology that cancer is a genetic disease. And we've spent hundreds of billions of dollars on the cancer genome projects. We're spending millions and millions of dollars on new cancer therapies, immunotherapies, and all of these things. Those are the, the products of the genetic theory of cancer. But if cancer is not a genetic theory, it's not a, 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 a gene link phenomenon, then all that stuff will never be optimal. In, and, and that's what we're seeing. That's why we have 1,700 people a day dying. The promise of putting hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into chasing genes and targeted and precision medicine and all this kind of stuff is not coming to fruition. Cancer is killing more and more people. And we're doing all this stuff. And with the stuff that we're doing is based on a flawed theory. And if the theory is not correct, then you're then you're not going to get it's not that they uh they ignore a lot of it or or say, well, if if all of these big medical schools and all of these academic centers say cancer is a genetic disease, how could it be possible that all these people are wrong? And the fact is, is I don't know if they don't want to accept it or they're, it's not profitable to accept it. There's a lot of reasons. And the, the ideology says it can't be that. Uh, we've had some distinguished scientists say that if we're right that cancer is a metabolic disease, we'll have to overturn almost everything in the field and therefore it can't be, it can't be right. So uh, um, so that's not a conspiracy theory. That's called ideological dogma. Right? It's like a religion. It's like a pro political uh, affiliation. These are dogmatic views and the way they affect the rational mind. And it sometimes takes time for, for this to. But the, the bottom line we have here is the resistance to accepting cancer as a metabolic disorder driven by fermentation. The failure to accept that is, the, is, is ultimately responsible in large part for the 1,700 people a day dying from the disorder. So if the people are okay and comfortable with the progress that we're making, then then uh, stay the course. Mm -hmm. But if they're not uh, um, comfortable with the progress we're making, they might want to reconsider you know, why, why they go to hospitals and get poisoned and radiated uh, and, 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 and ask the right question. They're not asking the right questions. They're not offered alternative therapies. And th the beat goes on. 1,700 people. That's almost in an hour. We have almost 70 people dead in an hour from cancer across the United States. So, uh, so the the failure to to recognize this disorder as a metabolic disorder is ultimately responsible for the fiasco and the crisis that we have right now.
So they bring you in, they give you radiation and chemotherapy to kill the cancer cells. And then they feed you orange juice and a cookie and run glucose through the lines to clean out the lines before they send you home. Yeah. And that's due to the lack of knowledge. Yeah. So um, they're not trained. These not are not bad people. They're mm -hmm. just not trained to know what the nature of the disorder is. So the outcome is obvious when you don't know what the nature of the disorder is. Mm -hmm. You treat people in a very inappropriate way. So there's no conspiracy here. A conspiracy means you know how to how to manage something and you just choose not to do it. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. This is what we call lack of knowledge and, and uh, lack of training uh, and, and failure to read the scientific literature uh, on a lot of these parts. So this all and the ideological dogma all goes together uh, for the resistance or the lack of uh, advance. I've heard a lot of people talk about how they're really tired after chemotherapy. And so they go in a couple of days later to get what they call fluids, uh, which is, you know, some glucose water, some electrolytes, you know, it's more sugar that they're giving them um, to give them energy after right. they have had the chemo. And so once again, they're, you're going to the hospital to do that and you're going to a cancer center and then they're just feeding the cancer, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, it's, but they don't know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and when you tell them that, they get angry sometimes. So uh, because that makes them, how is it possible that the patient might know this and the very yeah. care does, caregiver doesn't know that? Mm -hmm. So what do you think the response is going to be? You're, you're a, a person not trained uh, in the profession is telling the trained professional that what they're doing could be harmful. Uh, same thing with the biopsies. I mean, there's so many scientific articles written on biopsy spreading cancer throughout the person's body. Uh, why would you do that if you know that it would be uh, harmful to the patient. And why are you taking the biopsy in the first place? I mean, all you want to uh, just assume that it is malignant uh, mm -hmm. without even looking at it and then just do metabolic therapy and it will e either shrink away or get really small. And then you can just do a small surgical procedure and get rid of it. So there's a lot of things we're doing that we really don't need to do. And many things that are being done that actually are, are potentially harmful to the patient without being recognized as being harmful. So how do we teach them? How do we get to a point where people like you who know this and know that that sugar feeds cancer cells, and I knew that long before I became a carnivore, that sugar feeds cancer, feeds cancer cells. That's why when they do the PET scan and do all those tests, they put sugar in your veins. They, you know, they give you sugar and it goes straight to the cancer and it lights up. And that's really cool because that's how we can find the cancer, but we're also feeding the cancer. So if I knew that sugar feeds cancer cells, why does just a normal oncologist or a normal doctor not know that and tell people to stay away from sugar or do a ketogenic diet? They do what the what the system tells them to do. All right. If the system tells them to do this, they do it. Right. So every every they have called a standard of care uh, for every disease that that we are treating. There's a so-called standard of care that's used, that's recognized by the uh, the, uh, the system, the, the community of, of professionals. And that must be followed. Uh, and if you don't follow that, you could lose your license because you're doing something that's not sanctioned by the system. So if the system says cancer is a genetic disease and radiation, now I have to, I have to be honest with you, we spent billions of dollars on the genome project with the promise that we would be able to target specific genes in your cancer and manage it in a precision uh, type of uh, therapeutic strategy, okay? But if but if cancer is not a genetic disease, that that strategy is ultimately not going to work. So it's hard to say that we've spent, you know, 15 years, maybe more, 20, uh, building these incredibly dense genomic maps that we would then hopefully be able to target the cancer and then manage and, and bring the death rate way down. Well, that has not happened. It's been a big bust. Uh, it hasn't worked. We got more cancer today than we've ever had. So clearly, uh, it's hard to swallow the pill that there's many, many wasted years in looking at gene when cancer is not a genetic disease. It's not a genetic disorder. So every cancer cell has hundreds and hundreds of different targetable mutations. And they're all different from one cell to the next. And that can explain why many of these new therapies that you hear advertised on television are not working for the majority of people. It's not a mystery. 
To mm -hmm. me, it makes perfect sense. And we're never going to change this if we keep viewing cancer as a genetic disease. The problem is Nobel Prizes have been awarded to scientists uh, who then are supposed to have this kind of a, a knowledge to move the field forward. But that uh, solidification of the academic and uh, pharmaceutical industries around a misunderstanding of what the nature of the disease is, is ultimately responsible for the failure to uh, move the field forward. So the promise of all this money that we've spent uh, never came. So we continue to use toxic radiation and poisons that we've always used. So we were hoping to get rid of radiation and chemo and use precision medicine, but it's not worth it. Precision medicine can, can sometimes kill you faster than the cancer can. So it's not, we're not moving anything. We're, sta we're, sta we're stuck uh, mm -hmm. in, this, in this vortex of, of, of going nowhere. And uh, until the cancer rec is recognized as a mitochondrial metabolic disorder, we're not going to make any major advance in dropping the death rate, period. And I've heard you talk about like the Inuit people and studies that have been done on people, um, you know, either from the past or current Inuit people that do not have cancer or did not have cancer before. And so can you talk about that a little bit, a bit like the introduction of the processed foods and so much sugar and all of that? Well, I think that's where uh, we, we see that our folks, the populations that have been evaluated thoroughly, um, but living according to their traditional ways, uh, whether it was the Inuits or whether it was uh, Aboriginals in Australia or certain tribes in Africa, these folks uh, were rare. Cancer was un, a, a not a recognized disorder in, in those groups of people. And they all ate traditional diets from whatever region they were uh, part of uh, 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 on the planet. So where did all this cancer come from? And it becomes very clear when when the Inuit folks stopped eating uh, their traditional diets and switched to the uh, great American diet and lifestyle, then they got massively fat, type 2 diabetes, uh, dementia, and cancer. Uh, all of these chronic diseases came very, very quickly within uh, a generation or two. And now they're some of the sickest folks on the planet. And I went, I had a chance to talk about this at the uh, Thunder Bay Medical School, which services many of the Inuit folks. Uh, and they were telling about how incredibly uh, debilitated they are with all these chronic diseases that they, that they never had. So clearly, it's a diet and lifestyle. And that's one of the greatest exports of us. Our, our American and diet lifestyle is exported around the world. And as soon as people start adapting to it, you get chronic diseases, uh, cancer, dementia, type two diabetes, obesity. I mean, it's very clear. It's very clear. I mean, there's no mystery here. It's uh, so that, and that creates systemic inflammation, damages oxidative phosphorylation, and then you get uh, dysregulated cell growth, which is cancer. And that also leads to mutations in the genome as a downstream effect. So the mutations in the genome are another effect. They're not the cause, they're the effect. So targeting effects will never be optimal in trying to manage the disease. You got to keep your mitochondria healthy uh, and you, the probability of getting cancer, the risk is significantly lower. And there have been studies using rats and chimpanzees and things like that to study- Oh, well, not effects. chimpanzees, no. not chimpanzees. And I, I brought that to the attention of okay. two zookeepers, one in San Diego and one one here in Boston at the Franklin Zoo, because we have a great, well, we don't have chimps, we have gorillas, but, I, but I've spoken to other folks about chimpanzees. And, um, you know, chimps will, will eat uh, uh, the same stuff that we eat. Um, if you give them McDonald's hamburgers or Burger King or, mm -hmm. or Taco Bell or a jelly donut, I mean, they'll, they'll love it. Yeah. But the problem is you have to take little chimps uh, right after, you know, they're weaned. Yeah. And uh, you have to put them on the great American diet and lifestyle. And then you have to uh, see how much uh, cancer, and obesity, and all the things that we have. But yeah. I, when I asked them to do that, I said, do you ever have an experiment? This would be great. They said that would be animal cruelty. Now, the, the chimpanzee and us are 98% similar in gene and protein sequences. They're our closest mm -hmm. biological relative. As yeah. a matter of fact, we don't even need to do the, use the chimps because we know it's going to come out. We know what's right. going to happen. We use the Inuits and, right. and we use the... We, Who's these other folks that clearly show when you switch to the diet, American diet and lifestyle, you, you get cancer and fat and demented and all the other things that go along with it. So this is not a mystery. I don't know why anybody thinks this is a big mystery. Yeah, there was a study, though, that you have talked about in the past with 
um, rats and something where you feed the cancer cells and see what happens, right? We don't feed the, the ketogenic diet. Oh, well, we don't feed the, the cancer cells to the mice. Uh, no, I mean, no, you feed their cancer cells. Like, what was that study that I heard you? T- I'll take this part out. What was that study I heard you talk about where, or you've seen in rats and mice, well, a ketogenic diet calorie- versus sugar for cancer? Wasn't there something like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, when you, when you, well, it's mostly calorie restriction. Uh, when you lower the calories into the body, the body naturally adapts to a lower, lower energy. And uh, what happens, the tumor cells are locked into a fermentation, which means you have to have large amounts of fermentable fuels in the microenvironment of the tumor to sustain its growth, because fermentation metabolism is a very, is, is a very inefficient way to get energy. And as the result, you have to have a lot of a logistic supplies of the fermentable fuels. So as you lower the blood sugar, the tumor cells are more affected uh, than the normal cells. The normal cells switch over to ketones, which is an evolutionarily conserved adaptation. As a matter of fact, our Paleolithic ancestors, uh, those folks that the hunter gatherers, uh, would have always been in a state of nutritional ketosis mm-hmm. because there was not there were no delicatessens or fast food on every corner in the Paleolithic period. There was none of that. In fact, we didn't even harvest grains. Uh, we live several uh, 100,000 years uh, without grain. So grain cultivation in the Neolithic period was the beginning of civilization, where people could build uh, houses and cities around farms. And then you could either uh, um, manage uh, livestock or, or grain, and you could keep everybody in one, in one location. You didn't have to go out and track down your dinner every night to, to feed. Um, but there was a lot of, in the Paleolithic period, there was a lot of exercise and there was very little carbohydrates mm-hmm. in the diet. So uh, so consequently, we would uh, rarely, if ever, be in a state uh, of obesity or let's put it the way, type two, high glucose levels, unless, of course, uh, a, a, a type one diabetic or something like this would have happened and those folks probably would have not survived. So the bottom line is we moved from uh, hundreds of thousands of years in that kind of an existence to uh, an existence around farms. But of course, there was still a lot of activity, uh, physical exercise and things to harvest. They didn't have the machinery and things that we have today. So there was always a good degree of exercise, even though we began eating more carbohydrates. So And the carbohydrates were not refined and processed. They were all natural from the grains that that we ate. So the explosion of cancer, obesity, dementia, all came within the last probably 100 years as we began to improve our technology uh, and ability to harvest large amounts of food and then process these foods into packages. And it's clear that is your origin. So cancer is part of us. Uh, cancer is our the result of how we live our lives. It's not bad luck. It's not any of these kinds of crazy things that you hear the genetics people talk about, but uh, it's the, our diet and lifestyle that puts us at risk for not only cancer, but all these other things as, as well. So we've talked about a ketogenic diet in response to cancer. And do you want to talk a little bit about what a ketogenic diet means for people who may not know about that? Well, you know, uh, we we did that because we worked in the epilepsy field and mm-hmm. we could stop seizures in children with ketogenic diets. That was a, a substitute for water-only fasting. Water-only fasting will uh, manage seizures, but you can't do it for very long. Um, and cancer can be demolished by water-only fasting if people can do it long enough. So, but, you know, to keep people uh, at least have something to eat and not throw you out of ketosis, because the tumor cells can't use fatty acids or ketone bodies. We tested, we interrogated all these tumor cells, and they can't use fatty acids or ketone bodies. So if you lower your blood sugar and elevate to a different fuel, then the normal cells switch to the new fuel, and the tumor cells get hammered. So they can't they can't do do that. So it doesn't have to be just a ketogenic diet. You can do it with a a Mediterranean diet. You can do it with a carnivore diet. You can do it with any diet that will lower glucose and elevate uh, ketones, even a vegan diet. I mean, the the issue, of course, is that you have to measure the ratio of blood sugar to ketones in the blood, which is done with a glucose ketone meter. Uh, We published the glucose ketone index calculator. It's a way to let patients know whether in the right zone to kill tumor cells. And you can do that with any diet. And, and and eating, oh, you know, I'm, I, I can't get down. I can't do this. Well, stop eating. Just drink water. 
and then all of a sudden, oh, now it works. The, pro the, problem, the problem is, is that when people have cancer, they're treated for a lot of different kinds of things that actually make it very, very hard to get into these new, new nutritional states. Uh, and people have to know that. So uh, um, like, you know, radiation and chemo, steroids and all these kinds of things they give patients, very, very hard to get into the critical uh, ratios that will kill tumor cells because you're giving therapies that actually raise the very the very fuels that you're trying to reduce. Mm -hmm. So this becomes counteractive. This is all so simple if people understood this is a metabolic disorder, it's not a genetic disorder. So why are you giving radiation and chemo to these poor folks? I'm trying to kill cancer cells. They, well, they can't grow if they don't have fuels either. So pull the plug on their fuels, they're gonna die without toxicity. So why do something that's gonna cause all this extra toxicity? And this is, oh no, we don't talk about this. This is, yeah. the, this is the problem. Right, now and a turning problem. Yeah, and a turning point for us was Ansel Keys in the 50s and 60s, where he talked about how fat is bad for us and fat is what makes us fat. That was a huge turning point in our history as far as our health goes. Since then, all of our diseases have been on the rise since we started with more grains, more processed foods, more carbohydrate. So um, the ketogenic diet, though, being in a ketogenic state is not a fad diet. I think it gets to bad rap. Because well, I don't know. I mean, it's it's the natural uh, ketogenic. Yeah. Our ancestors during the Paleolithic period had very little access to highly no processed carbs. Right. And where what carbs would they have? A, a fruit during the ripe season. Uh, anything that might be a little bit have any kind of a level of 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 glucose in it. But it was always very very limited. It wasn't yeah. excess like we have today. And don't forget, we evolved as a starving species, so we can humans can go a long time. Uh, without eating and as long as they have water, you know, we can we can live for a long periods of time. And people that are overweight uh, can live even longer. I mean, the, lo the longest record uh, was um, a Seamus um, Barberi from Scotland who went uh, 377 days on water only. Of course, yeah. the guy weighed like 450 pounds. But but that fat is stored energy. It's the it's the energy for the famine. So mm -hmm. we we were a feast and famine species for the majority of our existence on the planet, where we had plenty of food on certain occasions and no food on other occasions. So we became kind of like a, a scavenger kind of a, a, a species. But that's who we are as a physiology. Then all of a sudden, in a very short period of time, like an eye blink, you have massive amounts of highly processed carbs and no exercise, uh, sitting in traffic in front of a computer, uh, available to processed foods. And the next thing you know, we have all these chronic diseases, uh, which also impacts the nervous system, causing depression and all these other kinds. Of, that's a whole collateral groups of, of chronic diseases caused by uh, our, our diet and lifestyle. So, and, yeah. and, and you think people would know that, but we have an obesity epidemic. So apparently either they don't care or they don't know about it. So what are you going to do? Yeah. And so for a ketogenic diet, it's lots of fat, some protein. You can do low carb vegetables, low carb fruits like berries, right? You just don't want any processed food. Well, you, you don't, don't want any of that. I don't know. Everybody should take their glucose ketone yeah. index measurements and let them know. I mean, I don't know. So some guy could eat berries. Another guy might not be able to eat berries. We're all different. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's individual. Uh, yeah. And everybody who would want to know if they're in nutritional ketosis, uh, which is about 5.0 or below, um, that may be 10. But if you want to kill cancer cells, you got to go to 2.0 or below on the ratio of glucose in the blood to ketones in the blood in a millimolar ratio. And that's available through Keto Mojo, these meters that you can buy on Amazon. Uh, and they have the free Libra, which is a constant glucose monitor. And once uh, they'll probably get glucose ketone monitors in the future with the technology. So people will always know what level of ketosis they're in at all times. Mm -hmm. So there's no mystery here. So the vegan wants to get in there. He can get in there. The pescatarian, he okay. wants the carnivore, the Mediterranean guy doesn't make any difference. And then okay. they'll learn what to eat uh, and how much to eat under whatever diet they, they happen to prefer. And then people so, will come to know. So for people who say, Okay, so you want me to be in nutritional ketosis, which means I'm going to eat more fat than I'm used to eating because I usually, you know, live on carbohydrates. So am I going to be trading cancer? Maybe, maybe I'll kill the cancer cells, but do I then get heart disease and have a heart attack or have blocked arteries? No, I would. Right. We, you actually get super healthy. Uh, now there is a there is a caveat, and I learned that when we worked in the epilepsy field. Every now and then, one out of five hundred kids just can't stop eating the fat. That they love so much ketogenic diet. 
mm-hmm. that it, they get insulin insensitive from it and their seizures don't get controlled. So if a cancer patient says, oh, I just want to eat fat and 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 the next thing you know, they're, they they your your blood looks milky. Uh, we've seen that when when the mice and people eat so much fat, your 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 um your serum uh, looks looks milky, your mm-hmm. blood looks milky. Uh, that that ain't healthy. Okay, mm-hmm. when we say ketogenic diets, carnivore diets, vegan diets, all done in calorie restriction. It's not okay. done by you know going out and eating you know fifteen avocados. You know it's it's like um, everything is done with the meter. The meter tells us it's a quantitative measure, takes all the ambiguity out. Or all, can I eat this? Should I do that? I have no clue. Right. Look at the meter. Everybody should get the, you know, the glucose, the mm-hmm. ketone meter and say, okay, I guess I can't eat that, can I? Okay. Right. You- yeah, that's a great way to look at it. I have a bio coach meter that I use a lot uh, yeah. recently. I had kind of gotten away from it for a while, you know, when I was trying to when I was trying to lose the last few pounds a couple of years ago, I was using it a lot so I could keep myself in ketosis and make sure I was eating the right amount of fat, make sure my glucose was down. But then, you know, you go into maintenance mode, you know, I don't have, I don't have cancer. So for me, it wasn't, it wasn't about, it was about healing. It healed a lot of things, but it was about weight loss at the moment. And then I just kind of went away from using it. And I was shocked when I started using it again in the last like week or so to realize that I am not in ketosis. I am, I don't know which part I'm doing wrong, but I was not in ketosis. Well, I don't know um, if it's, you know, in our society, I think now that we have so many wonderful, and I'm also not telling people you can't eat a ham, a McDonald's or a Burger King or Taco Bell. I mean, those things are very, very tasty and they can bring enjoyment uh, to a lot, uh, to a lot of people. I, I think they just have to always recognize that uh, if you want to stay healthy, uh, you might want to uh, temper a little bit uh, on some of those things or or use them as kind of a treat rather than a, a, a daily substance, because we know that they're harmful in constant large quantities because the, you wouldn't have all these health issues if if we were all in a paleolithic. Now, obviously, during the paleolithic period, there were a lot of things that could kill us like an infection, uh, being gored or attacked by an animal or falling off a cliff and, uh, or any, we didn't have a lot of the meta. So your, your longevity on the planet uh, would probably not be as long um, a, a, as it would have been for, as we have today, but we're living longer, but I don't know if we're living at a healthier, uh, at a healthier state than, than, those, than those previous times. But uh, we certainly know what we should do. Um, but we're not getting, I don't know if we should say, that, is it the government's responsibility? Everybody says government is too intrusive already. Mm-hmm. Why should the government tell us eat that or don't eat that? I think everybody has to make their own decision as to what as to what they know. With the information available now, anybody can go out and look and say, okay, I know what I need to do. But, but the problem is, is that no, but very few people know this. And or even understand what's going on. And they think, yes, eating fat will make them fat. It's very hard to get fat. Fat is either burned on the spot or it's excreted. It's really not stored except the triglyceride backbone is two triglycerides can be made into a sugar molecule. But you're burning energy to do that. So um, so, yeah, you can only get carbo. We don't we our bodies store carbohydrates in the form of fat. That's why our kidneys are very, very effective in, re, in capturing all the sugar, uh, carbohydrate, glucose that we eat and recycle it back into the fat cells. The only way you start peeing out sugar is when you have a diabetic situation, uh, in, in which case there's clearly a, a major disturbance in metabolism. But we store all carbohydrate. If we don't burn it right on the blo- on the spot, we store it in fat. Fat we can't store as carbohydrate, we except some p- little parts of it. But so... So the word, the best way to gain weight, if people really want uh, are feeling that they're too underweight, uh, is to eat a large amount of sugar with fat. Mm-hmm. So the body looks at the fat as saying, "Wow, we have plenty of energy," and then let's store every single molecule of sugar in our fat cells. So the best way, to, and that's called the icing on the cake. If you take cake icing, it's lard, which is fat, mixed in with powdered sugar and maybe a chocolate or a vanilla flavor, and boy, that'll that'll you don't, you don't have weight. You can eat, eat the icing on the cake. That'll put the weight on you. you know? Yeah. And I was going to say, and that is what people are doing on a regular basis every day, all day these yeah. days is they are eating large quantities of carbohydrates or sugar along with fat by way of French fries with the, you know, with children, with their happy meal or with the quarter pounder. And it is possible though, to eat in a ketogenic state 
and fight the diseases well, yeah, yeah, going that's in, true. in the fast food direction. That's absolutely true. But it's isn't it more pleasurable to be in a in a, in a happy meal state? I mean, uh, because obviously, if people were if, if if people didn't want to be in that state, you wouldn't have the obesity epidemic that we have. So um, it's obviously easier to eat happy meals and do all this other stuff than to sit down and eat uh, an avocado with no cracker. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's be honest. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. It's a meat. I mean, right. I mean, when people eat a big side of beef, they like to have a potato or mm -hmm. or something to go along with, a nice piece of bread to sop up the juices with a nice slab of butter on it. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. I mean, this is not something we're going to shy away from. Right. You know, well, in our house, we meet with a side of meat. So we have steak with bacon or steak with beef bacon or something like that. You know, we mix it up. But it is possible to go to fast food restaurants. You just have to do some research. Wendy's, Burger King. Five Guys, McDonald's, they're all 100% beef. So you can go in there and stay in a ketogenic state by getting, you know, just the burger or the burger with the plastic yeah. cheese and the bacon even. I mean, you can do it. I know you can, but it's much better to have the bun on. Unfortunately, that's true, but stop <laughs> it. We're trying to help people here. Well, I'm just telling you. I mean, this is not, you know, it some crazy guy going out. I mean, you ever see those people? Oh, I can't have the bun. And they're always the most overweight guys. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the heaviest weight guys are the ones that are always fearing the bread. You know? <laughs> I, I I went to a party the other day and there was a guy there who I don't know, but I heard him ask, he had a whole plate full of food and pie and biscuits, right? And cornbread. He had all this food and some potato soup, you know, some white potato soup that's white because of all the flour in it, right? He had all this food. And then he says, do you have any unsweet tea? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> that's oh, not yeah. the problem. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I mean no, it's true, absolutely, that's not the problem. Absolutely. You know, my grandfather... Uh, did that when he had diabetes this was years and years ago. And uh, he, he he would have a big piece of chocolate cake after the meal. And then he had a, a piece of sa a little saccharine tablet that he would put in his coffee. And and he wanted to let everybody know how, re how resilient he was putting the saccharine tablet in his black coffee while he ate this monstrously large chocolate cake. So, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> this is what people do. I know. That's what I'm saying is like, just think about it for a minute because the sugar, if it was real natural sugar yeah. in the sweet tea is better for you yeah. than the potato soup filled with flour. Oh, oh right. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. so think about those things, people yeah. like think about the choices that you're making. Well, you know, people like to have contests, you know, and um, they can go out and see who can get the, the highest GKI. That's where your blood is almost like crystal sugar. That's horrible. You have no, you have no ketones in your blood at all. So, um, I mean, yeah. and that's, you know, when you see the people with blood sugar levels of three, 400 milligrams per deciliter, I mean, these are diabetic, these are, are not healthy situations at all, you know? So you're trying to bring that blood sugar down to 55 to 65 milligrams per deciliter, which is hard, believe me. Yeah. Water yeah. only fasting will do that. But uh, those, are the, those are the states that will kill tumor cells. Because don't forget, tumor thrives on high glucose and glutamine, the other amino acid. And those two, we need drugs to target glutamine. There's no, there's no diet that will lower glutamine. Exercise will lower glutamine, but uh, you really need drugs. So that's what our strategy has been. It's been um, diet and drugs, synergistic effects of diet drug combos uh, while in states of nutritional ketosis. And that seems to kill and uh, a lot of gradually destroys the tumor cell over time. Uh, and you gradually get healthier. And it also, it reduces your type 2 di diabetes, your hypertension, your high blood pressure. All that other stuff goes away as well from the folks that have done this. So so clearly this works. But is it easy? No. I'm not going to say it's a piece of cake. Right. You know, try not eating for several days. You'll know what you have, you're have. you up against. And right. there's some folks that will never do it. They just say the hell with it. I'll just take the chemo and the radiation. I'm not doing this stuff. But yeah. you, they should at least be offered the opportunity to to know about that. Oncologists should should be knowledgeable about that. Um, but they they right now there's this does not exist in any significant way in any in any healthcare institution uh, that I know of in this country. And do you think it's safe to say that if somebody followed a really good, clean, nutritional ketogenic diet, that they could avoid cancer altogether? You mean like our uh, Aboriginal folks? Yeah. <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> you want to live like an Aborigine or a caveman? Um, well, with modern conveniences, yes. <laughs> uh, well, there you go. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it depends on your outlook, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I want to be here for my kids and my grandkids. And so I'm going to do what I need to do. 
Yeah. Well, and then, you know, you're just, you're, you're right. You can do it. Um, it's not easy, but it certainly can be done. Uh, and you know how hard it, it's really very, very hard to get cancer if you live in your natural diet and lifestyle. So even if you have chemical, car like the, the monkeys in the zoo, the chimps and the gorillas, um, they rarely get cancer. Uh, in fact, there's never been a documented case of of breast cancer in a female chimpanzee uh, in, in, uh, uh, in, 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 in zoos. Let's That's put amazing. it that way, right? And, and, um, and, and breast cancer is now approaching taking over uh, heart disease for women. So, so what's going on? The chimpanzee is is in the, drinking. I don't know. I mean, he's living in the same general environment. There's humans that are living around the zoos where these chimpanzees are. Uh, so what's and they're he's breathing the same air as as we are. Um, he's living in the same general environment. The only thing different is he's following his diet and lifestyle that he evolved as a species to mostly do, and we're not. <laughs> is this? It's not a complicated thing here, right? right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and in fact, I, I, we have a study that we've looked at over and over again from, from South America, where they took these South American macaques or whatever, rhesus monkeys or something, and they rubbed uh, chemical carcinogen tar on the monkey's arm for 10 years. And then they started to inject these monkeys with the chem the carcinogens. And, and they got one monkey out of 10 years out of all these monkeys that had some small growth. And their conclusion was, uh, these monkeys are not good models for for cancer. So so I mean and 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 but you know it's hard to get cancer. You really have to beat the crap out of your body uh, with all kinds of uh, lack of exercise and terrible foods uh, and, and well maybe smoking and drinking and all the other things. We have to the chimps and the, they don't usually do that. But I, there are but that's what we'd have to do to show that we could get chimpanzees to get cancer. They would have to be smoking and drinking alcohol, no ex and eating completely different diet than they normally would. And then, but of course they say that's animal cruelty. So right. we have to use ourselves as, as control. So, um, you know, and our Aboriginal ancestors rarely if ever got cancer. In fact, Albert Schweitzer, the humanitarian, couldn't find 40,000 Africans. He couldn't find any cancer that were living according to their traditional ways. So so everything in my mind is diet and lifestyle. It's not a genetic disorder at all. The mutations come from, from once the cancer starts, they produce reactive oxygen species, which are carcinogenic and mutagenic. So the mutations in the nucleus that people are all focusing on are all downstream effects uh, of of the damage to the uh, en energy metabolism of the tumor cell, so everything in my mind is completely explainable, and and targeting this process has tremendous therapeutic benefits uh, if people know how to do that. But you're not going to hear any of this if you go to the top medical schools into their oncology centers. In fact, they wouldn't even they might ha not even know about that glucose. They never heard of Otto Warburg. May most of them. Don't, don't know, not all of them don't know that sugar drives the dysregulated growth. So how can the, you manage the disorder if the academic institutions and the medical institutions themselves are not up to date or understand or compliant or even wanting to know uh, this information? There's no conspiracy here. It's just a massive lack of knowledge and inability to move on, on the, the knowledge and truth. So if you're watching this video and you want to do one thing to stay healthy and and be healthy and be around longer, the one thing you can do is cut out processed foods and sugar and then check get yourself into nutritional ketosis, especially if you're already sick, if you already have dementia, Alzheimer's. And, and also exercise. Cancer. Make sure you, that you keep that exercise up daily. Aerobic exercise, weightlifting, all this stuff. This is what our ancestors had to do, Yeah. right? I mean, they weren't sitting around in the front of a computer or a television screen or sitting in traffic. I mean, they were out working. They had to do things. Otherwise, they weren't going to start. They're going to starve to death. So right. we evolved it. We have to be active and we have to have a, di a lifestyle. But that doesn't mean you have to cut out the pleasures uh, of, of your life. I just think you have to moderate. But that's And find most, pleasure. Most, most, most humans are not moderate creatures. Yeah, right. Well, or find pleasure somewhere else. Like I'm an abstainer. So right. I have to abstain completely from any kind of sugar, you yeah. know, and things like that. Or else I want... I mean, the week that I became a carnivore, I had eaten 20 cupcakes in 36 hours. Like wow. I am an abstainer. I have to completely stay away from it. So there are other ways to find pleasure. We have just made every single function, every place we go, everything we do oh, yeah. about the food.
Everything yeah. is about the food. So like, and that's fine. You can do that. <laughs> Just choose the right foods, right? Well, it's not only I mean, us. I mean, you could go to the zoo and see everybody. I mean, the, the, the happiest days of the, of the existence when they're pounding something down, whatever they're eating. Yeah. Right? yeah. Cows are yeah. munching all day long. I yeah. mean, I mean, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, fish, uh, everything is like looking for the big next big meal, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> right. That's true. But we can choose the right things. We can choose our ancestral appropriate diet. Yeah. 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 But watch a dog eat. I mean, this dog is like inhaling. I don't even think they spend time chewing the food they eat. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> right. I know. That's right. So, um, so what's your, what's the best way for early detection that you can think of? Because all the time, we all know somebody who found out they had cancer and then almost right away they were so sick, you know, and then they were gone within a few months. How do we protect ourselves against that? Is there, is there a way, are there tests yeah, that we well, should be doing? Well, some people put the problem off for a long period of time, mm -hmm. allowing it to get much worse than it was. I mean, uh, you know, early detection, but when you, when you have a diagnosis of cancer at the beginning, when you are first diagnosed, the conditions or the symptomatology may not may not be so catastrophic. Uh, some people say, God, I went for a checkup and I, now I find out that I have stage three cancer. I never even knew I, I had this. So your body is strong and healthy. Uh, and that's when you attack the, the metabolic weakness of the tumors uh, at that point. Putting patients at risk for poison and oh, toxic poisons that they give to some of these cancer and, and surgical mutilations. You know, our strategy has been to bring the patient back into a full state of health, shrink down the tumor. And if it can be completely debulked with surgery, they should do, they they can, I can't say what should be done and what not should be done. I'm not a physician. All I can say that it gives them an opportunity to debulk and cut it out, le leading to a potential cure. So uh, shrinking it down, sometimes it goes away completely. Uh, through non-invasive, like you said, PET scanning, MRI, CAT scan, all these kinds of whatever they use in non-invasive ways of looking at lump, looking at the lump, the lump went away or whatever, mm -hmm. or it goes down to a very small lesion, which can be easily surgically removed either by the surgeon or even from a proton beam radiation, as long as it's on a very focal spot. And there's so many ways to manage cancer without putting the patient at risk for damaging the body, uh, making all these horrific toxic effects, hair loss. Uh, every time I see a, a bald-headed person who's been treated for cancer, I say the person who's treating them has very little knowledge about the biology of the disorder they're treating because you're trying to kill cancer cells. And why, why would you white hair fall out? Uh, what do, you, what, do they think cancer cells are in each hair follicle? Why would they, your hair fall out? Mm -hmm. uh, it makes no sense. Well, it stops all dividing cells. Yeah, in your gut. I mean, you you have a breast lesion or or a prostate lesion. Why, why why should your gut be blown to pieces and your hair falling out? Um, that speaks to the lack of knowledge on the part of the industry and how to treat cancer. So um, each person should be their their own control in knowing uh, what to do. Not these mass uh, groups of people that are all you know po uh, starved to death to manage their, the, the, the 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 fact is that we don't know how to treat cancer. Because the knowledge, that theory under which the disorder is viewed is incorrect. Once you realize it's a metabolic disease, then the strategies are, are so many non-toxic ways. And each person would be their own control, you know, and determine, oh, you've been diagnosed with potential stage four cancer, which means that you are terminal and you're living beyond 10 years. And somebody says, at what point does this thing become terminal mm -hmm. or not? So yeah. uh, again, your whole view of what and how to manage this disorder must change. Otherwise, uh, we're still caught in the rut. And this is all knowledge based. And we and others have shown clearly that this disorder is a mitochondrial metabolic disorder. And the gene mutations are downstream effects. And most of the treatments today look at targeting the tumor cells rather than the whole body itself and marginalizing the tumor cells by depriving them of their fermentable fuels. This is not generally known. And the resistance is there's no clinical trials. Uh, it's not gonna generate the same revenue as the other strategies have generated. So you put all that together and there's gonna be a tremendous resistance in adapting this new approach to managing cancer. So people have to put the pressure on these institutions. The guys, the guys are, that are there are not going, the top guys are not going to make any changes. They're, they're very comfortable 
in in what they 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 look like they know stuff you put on a nice white coat and a tie you walk around with a name tag makes it look like you know something but you know when it comes to we got 1700 people a day dying from cancer obviously now don't get me wrong we have millions of cancer survivors using standard therapies right well cancer survivors but many of them pay a huge price uh, they have all kinds of uh, damage to the brain the body hormones, gut disturbances, bone density problems, neuropsychiatric problem, hormonal issues. I mean, of course, that's what's going to happen. If you took any bunch of people and irradiated and poisoned them, you're going to have all kinds of uh, adverse effects uh, if you survive the radiation and poisoning. And then your body will come back and say, oh, I got a different kind of a cancer. I never had this before. Well, damn. I mean, so all this is perfectly uh, understandable and explainable. It's just that, uh, and the folks, listen, scientific literacy is really important. You're living in a technological scientific age. You don't know jack about this. You're going to you're going to be suffering. You're going to pay the price for your lack of knowledge, people. So they better wise up. Otherwise, you're going to be on the end of somebody's inappropriate treatment strategy. That's right. You got to be your own advocate. That is so important to do your research. And if your doctor says something that makes you question it, find a new doctor, go get a second opinion. Yeah, you know, and cancer especially, I think. But, you know, obviously for hip replacements and shoulder replacements and some of these other kinds of procedures, the technological advances have been astonishing, uh, astounding, I should say. And um, I think we we need to um, recognize where medicine has really improved our overall uh, health and survival and, and where it where it hasn't. And the cancer field is is one of those areas which is uh, medieval in its uh, yeah. current practices. Yeah. And don't just stay with your doctor because you like your doctor or because it was your doctor last time you had cancer, you know, do your research, question your doctor. And if they get upset with you for questioning them, you should go get a second opinion for sure. Don't you think? Yeah. You know, it's really very, un it's very uncomfortable um, situations when yeah. you have this nice guy who's very friendly and then you begin to question his practices and all of a sudden he doesn't become as friendly and then you feel bad making him upset. Right, so yeah. you know, the whole thing is not, is not. A yeah. But this is your health and this is your life. So yeah. do the research, so, learn stuff. You don't want to, you know, he went to medical school and he did a lot of training and he paid a lot of money to go to this. And now all of a sudden you're questioning what, what he's doing. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and he feels upset and you feel embarrassed and he's embarrassed. I mean, it's not a good thing and it shouldn't be that way. Uh, the patients, he should be knowledgeable enough to say, listen, we're not going to, if somebody wants radiation and toxic poison, nobody, they're not going to be denied. They're, people say, I listen, doc, do poison and radiate me as much as you can, and uh, I'll see if I survive. You know, we're not going to, they already do that, actually. Right. That's, That's the norm. That's the norm, actually. But uh, it doesn't have to be that way. That's my my point here. And we have the solid research that we've done to show it does not have to be that way. We have not only people, but preclinical studies all showing that you can manage cancer. I don't say cure cancer. I say manage cancer. You can improve overall survival, survival and quality of life significantly over what we're currently doing. Does a person is cured of it? Who knows? They should be just thankful they're living longer than they were predicted to live and their quality of life is good. That's what they, they should be uh, happy about that. Oh, well, give me a cure for cancer. Well, listen, the person curing for cancer comes from a combination of diet, drug, lifestyle, and what that person is capable of doing. Okay. And we don't throw out all standards of care. These standards can be used in appropriate times at the right place, timing and scheduling. Some of the immunotherapies that we hear advertised could be very effective as a last uh, part of the treatment rather than at the beginning. So everything is there. We just have to know how to use all the tools that are available. Yeah. Well, I think this is a great place to wrap it up, Dr. Seafried. Thank you so much. It was such good information you gave us today. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Awesome. So until next time, be well, be safe, and I'll see you next time here on the Carnivore Revolution.